Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for joining us for today's AFP Los Angeles Las Vegas section. Uh, very special meeting. We have a distinguished speaker today. Uh, very exciting hot topic and uh, also bring attention to a very important uh, subject, lighter than air technology. Um, so we all read the uh, uh, bio online for our distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Rajkumar Khan, and uh, he is a professor in IIT Bombay, which is a very prestigious university in India and the leading university in the world uh, in aerospace. Uh, he published more than 260 papers and he has been lecturing all around the world. And he is a renowned professor uh, in India. He is passionate about education and students. And uh, he also uh, been, um, uh, you know, um, on the list of very renowned uh, aerospace scientists and uh, uh, professor. So you can read all more detail online. I'm not going to repeat everything here. Uh, and uh, so uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Rajkumar Khan for uh, today's uh, exciting uh, uh, talk and discussion. Uh, by the way, uh, after the, the, the talk, you are welcome to unmute yourself uh, to speak out your question uh, or type your question in chat and to an inbox. But it's probably better you can speak out. Please click raise hand on Zoom or type in the chat to indicate, indicate that you're going to speak out. Thank you so much. So welcome to Professor Khan. OK. So uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, and a very warm welcome and a good morning to all of you guys who are in the Los Angeles, Las Vegas area. And a very good evening to all the other people uh, who are joining in from India. I, as I, uh, before we start, I have a request to Ken, if you can just forcibly mute everybody else, because there are some people whose mics are on. It will be helpful if everybody else can be muted. So I come to you from uh, the, the meeting room of a college in rural Maharashtra. This college is called as Anna Saheb Dange College of Engineering and Technology. And that is what you see in the back, ADCET. It is a, a college <clears throat> located in the district of Sangli. And uh, apart from many departments, it also has for the last 10 years, a department of aeronautical engineering with 60 students every year. So they have invited me for a series of interactions with students, faculty. And uh, because of that, I have requested them to use this facility for today's presentation. So I'm going to now uh, share my screen. Uh, just give me a minute. Okay, so for some reason, I'm not able to see. Uh... Uh, quick share screen. Yeah, yeah, I, I tried that. Okay, let me see if I can do it through this. Okay, so the screen is being shared. Just bear with me, it is taking some time. Yeah, it's, it's coming up. Yeah, it's going up slowly like a Chinese balloon. <laughs> I wish it would have gone a bit faster than this, but maybe that's an issue at our side. So maybe, uh, maybe I'll just uh, stop the share and try something else. Uh, this is very strange because we tried it out before, and uh, yeah, now it is now it is coming. Okay, fine. So there we go. All right, so can please confirm that you are able to see the screen now? Uh, yes, but there's something. Oh, okay, now it's clear. Okay. There, there was yeah, something about blocking. Now it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Okay. So, with your permission, I'll start the presentation then. Yes, go ahead. 
So friends, we are here today to get acquainted a little bit about this new Chinese conundrum that we have been facing recently, where someone claims that it is a surveillance balloon and somebody claims that no, it's just a breakaway airship. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. There are a couple of slides about lighter than air systems or LTA systems for short and balloons. And then we move on to the sequence of events that took place recently, the aftermath of these incidents. There have been other UFO sightings, not only in the American and Canadian airspace, but also in some other airspaces. So we talk about those. We spent a very small time to look at the difference between or the benefits of balloon versus satellites for surveillance. And then there is a question that many people ask about why was it required to use a missile to bring up down this balloon? Why not use just some gunfire or some other ammunition? And finally, in the end, we will have one slide on the takeaways of this particular incident, both to the two nations which are involved. Let's just quickly have a very brief outlook about the LTA systems. In fact, uh, upon Ken's invitation, I had delivered a detailed talk on this topic. Uh, during the pandemic online. Uh, essentially, lighter than air systems are systems in which a lighter than air gas is used to overcome gravity by the force of buoyancy. There are many candidates for LTA gas. In the order of their lifting ability, the top four candidates are listed as hydrogen, helium, methane, hot air, etc. However, we all know that hydrogen, though it's a very attractive gas, easily available, affordable, but it is highly inflammable. So we have to be careful. And there have been lots of accidents in the past uh, when we were new to this particular system. So most people shifted to helium, but helium is a very rare gas, very expensive. And hence, uh, an economical model of operating LTA systems can only work out when you use principally hydrogen or a mixture of hydrogen. The LTA systems were at the lead of aviation technology, but they went into the oblivion somewhere in 1930s and 40s because of a series of disasters. Uh, the most common of them, the most famous of them is the Hindenburg disaster. But also in the US, the Ekron and the Macon are two airships which had serious failures. And in the UK, it was RH101 on, their, on, the, on its maiden journey to India. But the technology of LTA systems was revived somewhere in the mid 80s due to a contract of the US Navy for uh, surveillance of naval ships you know, for a long duration. I think it was a month at a time. And now because we are interested more and more in environmental friendly systems, systems with lesser uh, emissions, carbon neutral or low carbon emissions, quiet. There is a huge revival about LTA systems. It's a very fast and emerging discipline. And there are lots and lots of new projects and ideas all over the world. Several countries all over the world are actively involved in looking at LTA systems. And China is one of the countries which has done remarkable progress in the last few years. A quick comparison between the conventional heavier than air systems on the right hand side and the lighter than air system on the left hand side. Obviously, uh, there are three positives and two negatives for LTA systems and there are three negatives and two positives for the HTA systems as shown with the green and the red colors. LTA systems have aerostatic and aerodynamic lift. When they move, they are highly fuel efficient and they are very easy to make and less complex mechanisms. But the biggest problem with them is that they are very slow and also not able to operate in all weathers. They are susceptible to weather changes. So they are at best fair weather vehicles. The HTS systems, on the other hand, they don't have aerostatic lift. They need to fly at a certain minimum speed to overcome the weight because of the relative motion between the air and themselves. They are consume a large amount of fuel, close to 30 to 40% of the operating cost of an airline is on the fuel cost. 
and they are very complex, but they beat LTS systems hollow because they are very fast and they are much less susceptible to weather changes. So although LTS systems have many things good for them because of their low speed due to large size and because of the inability to operate in all weathers, they are not very popular and not very uh, visible today. Okay. However, um, <clears throat> we should look also very briefly at the three main types of conventional LTS systems. Uh, you have a hot air balloon which essentially operates with the uh, principle that you can heat air and therefore re reduce its uh, density and hence generate lift. But a balloon is having no directional control, no propulsive system and therefore it just drifts with the wind. In the center you have something called as an aerostat which is an aerodynamically shaped envelope or balloon which is tethered to the ground which has got uh, stabilizing surfaces on the back as you can see. And below the balloon, you see another bump that is basically a covering for its payload. In this case, it is probably a radar system. But it has no power source, so therefore it cannot move around. So at best, you can call it as a platform and not as a vehicle. The one on extreme left, friends, is the most capable LTA system. It is an airship. It is powered. Therefore, it can overcome the winds to some extent. And it has got conventional controls like rudders, elevators, and fins. So it can be used for directional control. Now, today's discussion is only on balloons. So we will forget about aerostats and airships. And the balloon that we will discuss today is not a hot air balloon, but it is a closed, shorted, uh, closed balloon, right? So such balloons are not new. If you look at the historical information, Way back in 1794, in the Battle of Fleuris, uh, the French forces had used small observation balloons to look across the border or across the obstacles at the enemy. Then in 1912, the Germans used perceivable Singsfield type balloons. Again, these were large blocks of uh, inflated fabric with some kind of a stabilizing surface on the back. As you can see, again, these were deployed with a large number of manpower on the ground who would be holding it and trying to use it for aerial surveillance. Little bit better balloons, the Kakwe type kite balloons were used by the Allies in the mid later part of the First World War. Here you can see the inflatable fin structure on the back and on the bottom there is a jeep or a trolley to which the balloon can be attached. But still, there is a huge manpower required on the bottom. And finally, during the First World War, the Germans also came up with some observation balloons. So the usage of balloons for aerial surveillance observation is not new. But all these balloons are tethered balloons. What happened recently is the mystery. And we will spend the next few minutes trying to unravel the mystery of the Chinese balloon. So this is how the Chinese balloon looked like. Uh, there are three major components, as you can see. Okay, the first component is the envelope, which houses the LTA gas. In most cases, it will be hydrogen because there is no human being on board. So there is no legal requirement to put helium and hydrogen is easily available and affordable. Then you have solar panels mounted below, which allow it to generate power to power the onboard systems and the systems are carried in this gondola. So it's a very simple and elegant design, very affordable. Okay. And how big was it? Just a quick comparison. Uh, the big banana fun park ride is 70 meters in height and the opera house in Sydney is 65 meters in height. The Chinese balloon that uh, we are talking about was roughly about 60 meters diameter. Okay. So it was very large. Uh, in the initial reports, we were told that it was a width of approximately three buses, which is quite huge. As I already mentioned to you, a balloon is an unpowered system. It follows the ambient wind direction. And in this case, 
it was a reasonably large balloon the volume this was roughly little bit more than half the volume of hindenburg about 113000 uh, cubic meters which is quite a lot okay so what happened is uh, i'm going to discuss about the sequence of operations essentially we know from reports from all over uh, the world that four balloons were detected over the us okay the first one of them on 4th of february uh, at myrtle beach it was flying at around 18 kilometers altitude or around 60000 feet it was size of three buses as i mentioned which was eventually shot down over south carolina the second balloon after that was seen somewhere around 10th of february in alaska and this was a small balloon it was as against three buses in size this was a small car size next day on 11th of february in yukon there was a cylindrical object observed this is just a you know this is just a conceptual sketch don't uh, you know get mixed up so uh, on 11th february a balloon deployed at around 12 km altitude now that is dangerous because the altitude between 10 to 12 km is the altitude at which aircraft fly commercial aircraft fly and therefore we had to actually we got news that many of the flights had to be grounded and the air space had to be closed for commercial traffic because of the danger and then the fourth one was some octagonal kind of a shape found over michigan with some kind of strings so this is also a conceptual sketch so these were the four sightings that were observed in the us okay and in canada now the trajectory of the first chinese balloon shot down on 4th of february Uh, is plotted based on the data you have provided by the bbc this data is based on probabilistic modeling of the high altitude wind so the balloon if it has started from china and the chinese government has accepted that it went south and then turned towards the pacific ocean because of the wind current it was blown up entered from the alaskan area and then entered canada and then it entered us territory okay so let's look at the observation one by one so on 28th of june this balloon entered the us air space and from the reports that we got the us authorities did not acknowledge that the balloon has entered the us air space this is a huge question mark okay on 30th of june it enters the canadian air space okay and then alarm bells start ringing if i remember correctly uh, president justin trudeau prime minister justin trudeau actually uh, requested the authorities to take care of this flying object on 31st of june january it floats over the us airspace in idaho at that point of time there were serious considerations in the us to shoot it down but uh, there was an uh, there was a feeling that it will cause a lot of damage to the people down below and you know it could go and hit anybody there can be a lot of collateral damage so they decided against it but then subsequently when they found that the balloon is moving over montana near the air force base where there are several sites which we don't want outside countries to have a look at because of the strategic activities that take place it became too much and then finally uh, on 2nd february the us discloses that it has been flying in the us airspace for a quite some time and enough is enough on 4th february it was shot down so the life of the balloon was very short lived it has entered on 28th of january and it was shot down on 4th of february but a lot of dilly dallying took place and that is because this is not something which is very new this is something that is a recent activity and the penetration of uh, foreign uh, objects in your sovereign air space you know it is not something which can be tolerated okay let's look at the aftermath of what happened the first thing that happened is that the us secretary of state mr anthony blinken he was supposed to visit china he has postponed his visit on 4th the us decided that we are going to shoot down the other three balloons or other three objects which have been identified uh on 10th of february china was very quiet on 10th february they said that this is a overreaction they claim that it is a surveillance weather balloon which has strayed out of control and it is not a spy balloon but that claim is heavily heavily contested 
Uh, on 30th February, there is a counter allegation. China accuses the US that they have been flying hot air, high altitude balloons over Chinese airspace for more than 10 times. This claim is made by China and has been denied by the US authorities. So China kind of says that, look, you have been doing it for such a long time. So therefore, do not, you know, kettle calling the pot black, something like that. But this is a contested event. Now, there were a few things that happened because of this event. Okay. Uh, of course, this was uh, what happened to the balloon. As you can see, it was shot down and then it was collected over the sea by uh, these group of Marines. So the US considered this balloon as a threat to its nation and therefore, uh, after some investigation, some six Chinese companies in the US who were found to be associated with this kind of an activity, uh, they have been, uh, you know, there have been sanctions posed against them. And as I mentioned to you, there is a counter allegation from China that the US has been gathering intelligence via balloons over the last many years. Okay. So because of this, today we have a very bad relationship between US and China. Whatever was there has become very worse. Okay. That is the current situation. Now, I'd like to now add a few things here that this is not something unique happening only in the US. There have been other sightings of such vehicles all over the world. For example, here is a photograph of a balloon that was taken over the Indian territory of Port Blair. There are Andaman and Nicobar Islands located in the ocean. And, uh, you know, and uh, this is a sovereign territory of government of India. And in January last year, uh, unidentified balloons were observed over Port Blair. This is a photograph of one of such balloons. Similarly, Ukraine and Russia are at war, as you all know, and six Russian balloons have been shot down by Ukraine during the war. Okay. Then, US Air Force have also obtained in the Middle East some Chinese hot air balloon flying through the fall of 2022. But that was not in the US airspace, it was in the Middle East. Okay. And also, as I mentioned, US has already shot four identified, unidentified balloons over the last two years. Okay. So these are the four incidences that took place. Once again, just a, just a figure that shows uh, what I discussed in the last slide. And we believe that there is another sighting very, very recently in Hawaii. So there was a large white balloon operating at an altitude of around 40 to 50,000 feet, around 600 miles east of the Hawaiian Islands. And there was a notification sent. You can see there is a photograph of that particular message. Pilots were alerted, okay, at 7.46 a.m. early morning local time in Hawaii on 20th February, that means yesterday. Uh, some uh, pilots were alerted that there are some large white balloons which are observed at these altitudes. We don't know yet whether these balloons are the same class as a Chinese spy balloon or they are something else, but this is a serious issue. Okay. And there is a prediction of the trajectory of this particular balloon over the next 48 hours uh, based on the knowledge about the wind. So as you can notice, it is going to drift and therefore, all the pilots who are operating in that area have been cautioned to look out for any such unidentified free moving flying vehicle. This report has been released on 19th February 2023. Okay, at 1800 Zulu time. So, we now come to the point where we look at comparison between a balloon and satellite for surveillance. Assuming that we know that there are more than 400 Chinese satellites already in the space. They are called as the spy satellites. Okay. And all countries have their own satellites which are looking into areas of interest. Okay. So when we have so many satellites already available, what is the need to use balloons which on which we have no control at all? Their motion is random. Okay. So the thing is that a balloon is much, much closer to earth, around 11 miles from the ground. It is far less expensive compared to satellite, it's just a few thousand dollars. And it does not create space debris because 
once in uh, once its uh, work is over ultimately it is going to it is going to you know rupture and the material will come down so it will not contaminate or collect in the space unlike satellites which once launched in the space are going to continue to move there unless you bring them down and they will burn out satellites on the other hand are much far from the earth the lowest uh, satellite would be at least 62 miles in the lowermost space and they are far 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 more expensive compared to the balloons that is why balloons are a very cost effective option for aerial surveillance and spying okay except that there cannot be a very positive control on its trajectory but today we are able to model the weather very very accurately and because of that wind patterns all over the world at all locations are either known a priori or one can predict with a reasonable accuracy so therefore the trajectory of a hot air of a balloon can actually not be planned but can be very accurately modeled and that is what many people are doubting that there are people back in china with very sophisticated data about the wind patterns uh, through which these balloons are being tracked the question that many people ask and i have received many such queries in the last few days is okay there is a balloon but why not just shoot it down why not just use a gun to fire why do you need a missile to shoot it down so friends we need to understand uh, in this case uh, f22 was used to shoot down this particular uh, hot air balloon the maximum altitude of this aircraft as far as our information goes around 10 miles Okay. Now the balloon was flying at 12.31 miles, it was almost 2 miles or 12,200 feet above the maximum height that the aircraft can fly. So even if I use a gun, you know, the, the gun which is mounted on F-22 is a 20 mm Vulcan rotary cannon. The effective range of that is just 2,000 feet. So the balloon is above 12,200 feet from you and your bullet can only reach 2,000 feet approximately. So it won't reach. Okay. So that is one reason. Okay. Then second reason is that although it is expensive, AM-9X Sidewinder, which was used, is the smallest and the cheapest air-to-air -air missile in the US Air Force Arsenal. There is nothing less expensive than that available. And that is why it was used for knocking off. On the internet, there is a video making grounds. I don't want you to show. Uh, I don't want to show the video because I think that video is just uh, you know made by some imaginary or some uh, you know some VFX kind of a stunt. I don't think that there were people um, constantly filming and recording the launch of the balloon because we know that two uh, one missile was fired. It did not work, and it was lost. The second one is the one that actually shot the balloon down okay finally i would like to uh, you know uh, come to the point where we discuss about what are the takeaways of this incident to both the us and china okay for the us please note that the cost of operating this aircraft is more than 68000 dollars per hour and one sidewinder costs around $400,000. So the US had to fly F-22, few of them, for some time. And as I said, one missile was fired. It did not work. The second one uh, had to be fired. What did China spend? The balloon that was brought down in South Carolina was just around $10,000 max tops. If you look at the cost of the solar array, cost of the sensors, cost of the balloon, and cost of the gas inside. A rough estimate is $10,000. Okay. And yes, possibly it collected some very, very sensitive information, which might have been relayed also remotely. We don't know. Because the debris which has been collected, we don't still have any authentic report about what it contains. Okay. So, to a third person, because I am neither from USA nor from China, it seems to me that if the Chinese want to play mischief with the U.S. economy, they will keep on releasing such small balloons in the U.S. territory and you will have to really spend a lot of money to bring it down. Okay, so 
it could be a very unique ploy by the Chinese to really harm the US economy because they know that if a balloon is sighted and if you don't do anything about it, it will bring very bad publicity to the government in power and to the, uh, you know, the US uh, military establishment in general. Okay. So my take on this is that there was a huge expenditure trust on USA by China by doing this mischief. Now, even if you believe what they say, that it was a balloon which was used for weather data, I have my own doubts honestly about it. But suppose we believe what they say, it is a very, very huge and costly mistake. Thanks a lot for your attention. I would like to now open up the floor for any questions or any doubts that you would like to clarify. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, so folks, if you have, have you any question, please uh, click raise hand. Uh, I see two left. Uh, your mic is able, so please go ahead. Yeah, okay. There are a lot of chat messages, but I don't know. I could not see any of them. Uh, maybe we will take it one by one, no problem. We'll yeah, take it one by one. Uh, but right now, we'll open the floor. Yeah, we can open the floor for questions. Yeah, so, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, to, to your lab, uh, can you speak out? Uh, or maybe... Uh, so, Durla, yeah, yes, Durlab. Durlab is a student in my department. Uh, he is an army officer and okay. he is uh, also an... So, Durlab, please go ahead or you can go to Sudarshan also. So can you hear me, sir? Yeah, but a little bit low, Durlab. You have to just speak a bit loudly. All right. So uh, what I understand, sir, there is no uh, proof as of now whether there, whether there was any surveillance equipment or any kind of monitoring equipment on this balloon, right, sir? See, the reports which have come to us indicate that they did definitely find something. Okay. So it is not that it was just simple weather instrumentation. Some equipment, some equipment of some sophistication was definitely located. Now, I do not have the information on what it was and how uh, how detailed it was. So we have to await further information. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know. But maybe somebody in the meeting has better information. Uh, right, sir. Right, sir. That, is, that is my query. Basically, I just wanted to understand if there is any equipment for surveillance. Probably there must be some equipment for communication as well to relay that information to the end wherever it is required. So uh, that was my uh, you know, That's right. You are right. You are right. You are perfectly right. If there was an, if, if there was a communication. So you see, many of these things are not released to public, unfortunately. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, we really don't know. Uh, but let's go ahead. Uh, I think Sudarshan has raised the hand. Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible, sir? Loud and clear, Sudarshan. Yes, sir. Yes, Professor. So my question pertains to uh, the strategic value of the balloon systems. So one thing is that even if we are unsure that if there was surveillance equipment on the balloon or not, they do have the capacity to uh, use such an equipment and they pose a credible threat. Now, uh, in history, there are two occasions where such balloons were used for their nuisance value. One was by Japan during World War II. And the other was here in Britain, where they sent these balloons with long uh, steel wires so that they could uh, short circuit the high tension wires in Germany during the war. So my yeah. question was that, uh, how do you st um, strategically place these balloons in terms of warfare? So in open warfare, like uh, in wartime situation, they were more valued for the nuisance value than the actual damage done. But in case of a Cold War scenario where there is no actual war declared it's just a, a shadow fighting which goes on uh, do you think it is possible to scale up production at the same time develop countermeasures against it and how would you uh, very, uh, perceive the future in that sense very very good question uh, it's a very mood question uh, see uh, maybe this is a way in which they are touching the water testing the water so to say on how much, see, for example, if you noticed, even though the balloon entered the American airspace in uh, 20th of January, the shooting happened only on 4th of February, okay? So uh, they knew that it will not immediately happen because these are diplomatic matters and 
there is a lot of discussion on the pros and cons, cost economics, as well as on whether there is a potential of damage to anybody down below. Okay. So, uh, according to me, it is very easy to make these balloons. In fact, I saw a very interesting internet video in which two young boys, uh, you know, they flew a small balloon over the Chinese embassy and put a small camera below and they said, look, we are now flying spying over Chinese property because as per international regulations, mm -hmm. the airspace mm -hmm. over an embassy belongs to that country. Hello. So it's very easy. It's very easy to do this. These balloons yes. are available off the shelf. Hello? Yes, guys. Yeah, I'm here. Somebody, somebody is unmute. Please, un please, please mute yourself. Uh, I unmuted somebody. myself. This is Sean Boyke here in Los Angeles, California. And uh, yeah, I was very concerned. I noticed that uh, there's this YouTube video about the Canadian prepper, I think it's called. Anyway, they have very detailed discussions of people from Hong Kong and stuff, and they have maps and actual satellite imagery of a uh, hardened military facility on the islands off of the Philippines where the Chinese made their own man-made facility which they believe will house uh, thousands of balloons. And that's the way they have planned their attack and their assaults is by EMP, bioweapons, and all the other things required. Um, and that's for a Taiwan assault or any place else that they wanna go after. So what information do you have on that? Because that's what I'm very concerned about because if you can put an EMP in these balloons um, or bioweapons, uh, then the world's in a herd of trouble. Your turn. Yeah, I, I, I share, I share your concern, sir, because you know what they can drop. There was some, you know, what if they develop, they drop some, you know, biohazard devices on, uh, you know, on poor population below. I mean, uh, if they can, if they can carry a balloon for so many hours, so many days over foreign territory. And God forbid, if they have a canister full of worms or any other uh, bio uh, hazard uh, equipment, uh, material, I just don't know how 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 can it go. This can be a very 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 inexpensive way of bio warfare. It can be. Yeah, yeah. Well, they did their first test with uh, with COVID, and they did pretty darn well. So uh, I would be, I'm sure that transporting it now in a different way would be instead of having people go on airplanes and Nobody can come in. Everyone goes out. Now they can just drop it by balloons. So I think that everything they're thinking about is, is really old school techniques of warfare. But I think they're thinking that way. And it looks like we got something really serious coming up ahead of us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Vivek Kulkarni has raised his hand and also some other people. Um, three people have raised their hands. Okay, let's see. Ah, uh, sir, shall I ask the question, sir? Yes, I'm audible. Yes, Mr. Bulgani. Uh, yes, you're yes, audible. Sir. So I want to ask that: Is there any regulatory control uh, over these balloons? Like for the civil aviation aircraft, they have the control, like DGCA, EASA, and the worldwide. So for the balloons uh, specifically, will be there any regulatory control so that these uh, things cannot happen in near future in any way? No, Mr. Kulkarni, see, there is a regulatory overarching control saying that you cannot transgress anybody's sovereign airspace with any aerial vehicle. Okay. So the same rules that are applicable to aircraft, there are similar things applicable to even all flying vehicles. So I'm not aware of any special rule dedicated for only balloons or airships, but an airship or a balloon is also an aerial vehicle like an aircraft. The only difference is the buoyancy function and the speed. So the same rules are applied. Uh, let's move on okay, to the question by Mark. Mark. Yeah. Mark, would uh, you like I, to I, I saw a uh, YouTube video where although this balloon did not have directional control, it had altitude control. It could let off ballast to go higher and could let out the gas to go lower and could follow wind patterns at different altitudes. And that's how it got directional control to go to Montana and some of our strategic areas. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, 
you know, this, this idea of don't shoot it down over Montana because it might hurt somebody. I just did a quick Google search and, you know, the population of Montana is roughly 11% of the county of Los Angeles. And the county of Los Angeles in terms of geographical area is roughly 3% of the state of Montana. So I think the odds of hitting Farmer Jones in Montana was like, you know, minuscule, but they let it go anyway. Yeah. Well, what do you know about the altitude Sorry. control? Sorry, am I See, uh, what do you think? One minute, let me just answer the question by Mark, then we can go ahead. Uh, so Mark, what you say is making sense to me because uh, if a balloon has to be steered to a particular location of interest, the only possible way of doing that, according to me, would be to have some kind of a control. First of all, a prediction and a study of the wind patterns very accurately over a function of time and space. And then using uh, a buoyancy control by, uh, as you said, either releasing the lifting gas or by uh, dropping some ballast. It's very much possible. See, there is a large program in China. We are aware of that because we read their publications. They are publishing a lot of papers in the area of ladder than air system. In fact, um, I'm very sorry to say that the Chinese authors are essentially monopolizing all the publications in this area. So they have a huge program on LTA systems. And therefore, it is very much plausible that what you are saying is true. Sir. <clears throat> Hi, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? This is Vinod Mengle. Uh, yeah, so you have raised your hand, uh, Vinod. Yeah. So yes. Uh, sure. So question, but... This is Sorry, Vinod Mengle from the Los Angeles area. And uh, yes. my question is uh, different. Uh, you said uh, missiles are very expensive to shoot it down. So is this possible that the US uh, military I mean, Air Force has electromagnetic pulses to, to blast out or as they say, you know, fry the chips so that even if they collected some sensitive information that it wouldn't be transmitted? Do they really have yeah, such yeah. things, electromagnetic pulses or whatever they use? Yeah. I am not aware of what what the U.S. Air Force has, and if they have, I am not sure whether they will publicly release it. But what I would simply say, if they had something like that readily available, they would have used it. Okay, because they have not used it, and they have relied on the on the classical uh, inventory of a sidewinder missile. I would presume that they don't have it, unless they don't want to declare and keep it for some other application in the future. Uh, I really don't have any idea about I see. whether okay. they have. Yes, Thank you. It is possible. Uh, it is possible to use uh, heavy power laser beams mounted on some uh, aerial vehicles if the range is available. Here, the problem is that the balloons are operating. See, they they are very they are very interesting. They are operating at very high altitudes where it is difficult to reach them. The other balloons were uh, at a lower altitude, right? So they could use, as you said, lasers or electromagnetic, if they had one. It was very, very expensive, as you showed. I didn't realize the sidewinders were $400,000. It's a very yes, expensive yes. proposition. Correct. Very right. So something has to be done to come up with other devices which are affordable. Right. Okay. For such people. It can happen again. Yeah. And how many, how many missiles are you going to launch at how many balloons? Right. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, let's let's so let's first go to people who raise the hand. Manish, please wait. There are other people before you yes. who have raised their hand. Krish is one of them. Okay, sir. Krish, please go yes, ahead. Sir, am I audible? Yes, Krish, you are audible. Am I audible, sir? Uh, yeah. Uh, so my question was, uh, what's the way of uh, detecting these balloons? Um, I mean, uh, do they have a proper uh, radar uh, cross section? Uh, because in a documentary where I read about F-35, they have uh, mentioned that uh, they need to eliminate corners. And uh, as these balloons do not have exactly any corners, uh, do they would they even have any radar cross section? Uh, do we have any means of detecting them other than uh, visually? 
No, you, that's a very good question. Uh, the balloon material is completely radar transparent. And, uh, you know, it, there will be some reflection from the solar panel because that would be metallic, whatever you do. Or if not metallic also, it will be reflective. But the signature is so small that one could confuse that with a bird or any other object. So these balloons are very difficult to identify. This is another problem with them. See, they are a real nuisance. They fly at very low speeds. They drift randomly because of the wind. They are difficult to detect by classical radars. So we have a problem at hand, which you have very nicely highlighted. Okay, Mike Helton, you are next. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you are loud and clear, Mike. Please go okay, ahead. Thank you. Yes, um, I, uh, I think that your comparison of the finances is uh, interesting, but uh, that's only one side of the problem. Uh, uh, comparison, uh, the financial comparison of, you know, $400,000 and more to shoot down one balloon, which cost them 10000 is uh, is a good thing to know. But uh, the other side of the problem is the what they get out of that payload, uh, the value of what they're receiving from that payload might be worth considerably more than a $10,000 item. And so that has to be considered in your uh, financial conundrum. Agreed. I completely agree with you. See, if it was not so, then why would the U.S. Uh, forces employ uh, an expensive arsenal to bring out a balloon? Okay. I completely agree with you. But the problem on the other hand is that some miscreants can simply release a large number of balloons and then you have a problem at hand, a problem of plenty. Okay. So yes, yes. Mike, I completely, I completely agree that the nuisance value of getting surveillance information and maybe transmitting it to the adversary is far more than the cost of a missile. I agree with you. But first of all, we don't have even proper information right now as we speak. It's all a conjecture. And secondly, if it is true, it's a very heavily one-sided expenditure. Yes, and I, I would agree. And that uh, what we need to do is, is wait for the in investigation about that payload to identify exactly what they were getting and how much they could get. And then we could go from there. So I, I think that decision has to be made later when we understand that payload a little bit more. And uh, the other side of my question is, do you think it's worthwhile to spend a lot of money to uh, devise a system to capture a payload without any damage. In other words, to bring it down so softly so that we can investigate it more later. I, I agree with you. Yes, I think, I think uh, keeping in mind that such things can very easily go into uh, a situation, it is very important that we have some solution of, uh, it's a very challenging problem to all the enthusiastic people out there on how do you handle this menace? This is the real life problem. How to handle this menace with a cost-effective solution rather than firing expensive missiles. So it is maybe some kind of an unmanned aerial vehicle or a UAV can be thought of, but then the altitude is very high. Okay. So yes, okay. a very high altitude. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's go on to uh, Dr. Manish Tripathi now. He has raised his hand. There are others also, we'll come to them. So, uh, Dr. Manish Tripathi, you want to ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, sir, the thing is ki, uh, we know from our experience that the US is, airspace is considered to be one of the most uh, protected airspaces in, around the world. At least that is what we perceive till now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, in your slide, you said that uh, basically it was detected first time in, on 28 Jan, and it was ultimately shot on 4th Jan, right? So, uh, 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 what could have been the reason that they took so long to actually uh, take take down this foreign object? Okay, uh, I'll give you my impression, which uh, which is based on my own understanding. It could be wrong, but here is my take on it. Um, essentially, when you have such an object in your airspace, you are first of all not sure whether it is actually a rogue element 
or it is something that has drifted because it is well known to us that such balloons do drift. So to give you the context, uh, Manish, uh, for meteorological reasons, close to a thousand balloons are launched all over the world every day. And these balloons are meant for getting weather data and they go to a height of 35, 40, 42 kilometers. Okay. So it is not that it's a very rare thing to launch a balloon. Of course, they are smaller in size. They are not such large in size. Uh, in India, for example, we have a facility where we launch weather balloons uh, very regularly. And uh, I have been to their uh, one of their launches and uh, it's very, very innocuous. You know, you have you have a, I think it's a, 40, uh, if I remember correctly, some 500 grams of uh, sensors mounted below on a huge balloon of around 72,000 cubic meters using hydrogen. And they say that we launch it routinely and then after some time when the work is over, I think they go to 41 kilometers and they collect the weather data. And then, you know, they when they go to those altitudes, they will tear and they will fall down. And then these guys, they just use telemetry for tracking them and bring them down. Normally, it happens over the ocean. The problem here is that they were not, they were not sure, I think, that if we shoot it down, will it cause any serious third-party damage to people below? And that is why there was a lot of daily dialing. First of all, the urgency or the enormity of the situation, whether it is really for spying or whether it is a breakaway balloon as Chinese now claim, was not easy to establish. And also, the, there was a lot of daily dialing because of the possibility of uh, a huge collateral damage because of... Uh, people on the on the you know on the ground getting hurt but then when they observed its trajectory and when they found that it is going into areas which are completely undesired then maybe they took a decision enough is enough and we should now bring it down also please remember many decisions are also driven by perceptions uh, any government or any or any uh, you know agency cannot be perceived as you know just I've done nothing, something has come to my territory and I'm just keeping quiet. So beyond that point, I think the administration thought it will be very bad PR for us if we don't take any action. And that also could be a reason for, you know, taking the action to bring it down. Okay, moving you, on sir. to, moving on to the next, uh, moving on to the next person on the chat uh, or uh, let's see how many people have raised their hands. So, uh, Ken, are you able to see anybody? Yeah, there are. The Devendra, uh, sorry, yeah. but uh, Pradeep Sagdev, sorry. Pradeep Sagdev has been raising his hand for a long time. Pradeep, please go ahead. Pradeep Sagdev, would you like to ask your question or we should go to somebody else? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I certainly would like to ask a two-part question. One question is... Please. Uh, one part of the, can you hear me? Loud and clear, no okay. problem. The first part of the question is, when the balloon is detected coming towards our uh, airspace, is it possible to send another balloon of our own directly towards that balloon and get close to it to take pictures and find out what that balloon is up to? And the second part of the question is, can we use electronic jamming to disable the instrumentation on these balloons so that even if they are trying to, uh, trying to collect some data, the jamming will prevent from that, that data to be transmitted? Radeep, very good question. Now, remember one thing that the balloon is going to be steered without any control purely by the ambient wind. So if you want to launch a balloon which will trace the same path or chase an existing balloon, you will have to launch it from a place where the wind will take it towards that direction. So if we have very accurate data or prediction ability, maybe using AI techniques or maybe using some kind of a technology, uh, data sciences, then one can one can do what you said that just like the balloon has gone up and it is now doing some 
some mischief up there, we can send our own balloon to follow it. But we have to be very, very careful that we are able to model and correctly predict. Otherwise, you will have two balloons in the air and you know you just don't know what to do. So there may be other better methods which are steerable and directable, which can be so uh, uh, to me the best thing that seems to be is a unmanned aerial vehicle uh, we can think of one more application of the unmanned aerial vehicle for uh, you know uh, tracking the balloon and maybe going very near taking pictures maybe jamming the communication if there is one and uh, that way you will make the balloon useless to the adversary if it is being used for the purpose that you are doubting uh, I agree that uh, you, in principle, unmanned uh, uh, air vehicles could be used, but considering the altitude at which these balloons are flying, uh, it will be uh, difficult uh, to send a remotely piloted or an autonomous unmanned uh, uh, aerial vehicle uh, chasing this balloon, which is flying essentially in a random manner and get close enough to it uh, and uh, do the surveillance on that balloon itself. So uh, uh, a steerable balloon of the same kind might do the job better and perhaps uh, being able to jam the electronics on this uh, uh, adversary balloon may be the way to go it. Yeah, quite possible. Uh, I feel that uh, there is a lot of uh, development today in the high altitude long endurance vehicles. Of course, they are also very expensive. They, they, are, not, they are not very, very affordable. Uh, so, uh, but there are solutions like Global Hawk, which go very high and for very long time, which could be used. Uh, Devendra has been raising the hand for a long time. Devendra, would you like to uh, you. unmute and talk? Yes, Thanks sir. a lot. Could you hear Thanks me? Loud and you hear hear me? Me? Yes, we can yes, hear sir. you. As you mentioned, sir, these balloons, uh, 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 countries have been operating them for a long time. Like it's uh, for many years, starting from the World War One, And it's been a long time. Like for other uh, we weapons, like missiles, we have anti-missile system. For submarine, we have anti-submarine system. So don't you think this area of, of, you know, countering these measures of, you know, balloons when they are flying over a country has been ignored for a long time to neutralize them? And what could be the measures which can be taken up as a, like a immediate measures to uh, get as a countermeasures to neutralize them? Okay. So there was a good question, but let me clarify that the balloons which I showed you in the First World War and those areas, they were not free-flying balloons. They were tethered balloons or essentially, technically, aerostats. Okay. So, this is a different league because this is flying at such a high altitude that uh, it is a totally different thing. So, yes, you have raised the uh, point about the need for some cost-effective solution to tackle such problems. Uh, it is not straightforward that we have a solution. We will have to adapt existing solutions to meet the requirements, or we may have to come up with totally novel solutions. Okay, uh, I don't have an answer right now. Um, you know, we had uh, Pradeep Sagdev suggesting using a balloon to cancel a balloon. Well, it could be possible. I believe UAVs can be used, especially the high altitude, long endurance UAVs. But then there is a cost issues there. So we need to look at it. Uh, let us move on to John Chapman. He has been raising his hand for a long time. Uh, yes, John, please go ahead. Interesting history. The US Air Force started in the late 1950s to do air-to-air -air recovery of telemetry data packages and balloons. This uh, was accomplished by a C-119 or a C-130 with a hook in the altitude bands of 10,000 to 20,000 feet. Uh, it is practical if they wished for the Air Force to recover low altitude balloons without damage and their data. That's it. Okay, so low altitude balloons up to the height where aircraft can fly, one can actually practically recover them and bring them down to check them. I agree with you. Uh, However, the rogue balloon that we saw was at 40,000 feet or more. So it is a challenge. It is a challenge. Yes. 
Okay, great. Um, okay, uh, there is one more. Uh, anybody else has raised the hand? So there are a lot of young students on my on my left and right, left hand side. Maybe they have some questions. So if any one of you has any query, maybe you can raise your hand physically <laughs> rather than doing it on the software. So does anybody have any question which we can address? Sir. Yeah, raise your hand, please. Yes. Just introduce yourself. Mention your name loudly. Hello, my name is Tushar. And my question is that how can we differentiate the surveillance model and the spy Tushar, very difficult because whenever someone launches uh, any system for spying, they make it look like a conventional system. So it is very not easy to give away. There are no giveaways available. Even when, you know, there are instances when some countries or some uh, organizations, they use civil aviation aircraft for spying. But, uh, you know, uh, they don't, they don't, uh, so it's difficult to discern. So it's very difficult to make out. But what you can do is there are some telltale signs. For example, if you find that consistently the balloon or uh, whatever is, uh, you know, the object, if it is consistently going in the areas which are of strategic interest, then you can start doubting. If a, if a, if a balloon is actually a wayward balloon, it will not necessarily proceed towards areas which are of strategic importance. Okay, It could be a flu that the wind was blowing that way. But as uh, someone very rightly mentioned, there could be, uh, I think it was Mike, rightly mentioned that there could be a possibility that they are raising and lowering the altitude to catch the wind in the right direction. So yes, uh, it could be. But the problem is that this is a new problem that way. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a novel problem and therefore solutions are not immediately apparent and it is up for you interesting guys young people to come up with ideas which would probably be helpful in sorting out this menace because my guess is that we are going to see more of this in the future the impunity with which they were able to operate over american airspace as manish mentioned one of the most protected airspace it gives them a lot of confidence that we can do a lot of mischief and still not get caught that much. So they can disguise their systems and send it again. So we need to really put our heads together and come up with some kind of a feasible solution. Okay, so... Uh, let just me just one see. one question, okay. if I may. Yes, please. Yes, Pradeep, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, is it possible or is, is the technology advanced enough to use ground-based laser equipment to shoot this down? Too far away, according to me. With the current technological level of laser available, shooting a balloon at uh, even 10,000, 20,000 feet may be too high. And also, what would happen if by mistake some other flying object which is innocuous comes in way? You are going to create a problem. Yeah, that's certain, that is certainly possible. But uh, if uh, the intention is to shoot this down, then uh, precaution can be taken by redirecting the air traffic uh, around that particular uh, area of space. Yeah, can be done. Yeah, thank you. But I'm not sure whether I'm not the right person to comment on whether, you know, uh, we have laser weapons with such a high power that you can create uh, such a uh, damage to very high altitude uh, systems. I'm not aware of that, honestly. Okay, thank you. Uh, just for everybody uh, information, AIAA actually uh, recently has set up a new technical committee. It's called the UAP, and, and they has identified aerial phenomena technical committee. Uh, so if you're interested, please uh, uh, contact us uh, to join the technical committee and discuss. Very good. Very, very good. Very interesting. Yeah. Very and interesting. Also, I think AIAA... AWA has responded so quickly to uh, this issue by setting up this TC. 
commendable. Yeah, yes. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Professor Pan as the world leading expert uh, on this uh, lighter than air. It's a very interesting and important technology. Um, I see Dr. Tripathi has a question. Raise no, no, I've done. I'm done. Thank you very much. We'll work with uh, Professor Pond and uh, the AIWA uh, Technical Committee and, uh, for further uh, uh, activity on this. Uh, we'll follow uh, this important uh, subject. So yeah, in fact, the next meeting of the AIWA LTA Technical Committee is happening after four days and uh, after a week on, I think, 20, 24th, yeah, after about three days. So I will be attending that meeting from here online hopefully, because it is a bit late in the night for me. It will, be, it will be past midnight for me, but I think it is worth waking up and uh, attending. So uh, I hope to raise this issue in that meeting also, that we need to look at this problem. And I'm very glad, Ken, that you shared this news about the UAP. Yes, uh, that's very important. And uh, we want you to... Uh... Uh, for example, your student uh, there could also take a look and see if they can uh, join AWA as a student member. And uh, I, I posted in chat, actually, we have a Region 6 student conference. Uh, it's a little bit late now, but uh, uh, if AWA member, you can uh, uh, log in and uh, draft the paper for student. Uh, uh, the deadline for submission has passed, but next year, you are welcome to participate. Okay, definitely we will we will get this message. Okay, so we have been up for more than an hour now, and uh, uh, I, I looks like all the all the questions are taken care. So Ken, I'll I'll pass the control back to you, or okay. maybe close. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Professor, and thank you uh, for the student over there. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. So stay in touch uh, with us and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, so have a great day. Thank you, good evening. Thank you. And thank you, Ken, for inviting me to uh, conduct this session. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to more interactions with AIWA. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Good night to everyone, everyone from India. And a very good day for those who are in the other part of the world. Thank you so much. I'll just leave the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, everyone. So we are also uh, end the session and uh, the recording.